Ok. Perfect. So, um, uh, Brice, are you starting off or am I starting off? Oh, I can let you start at the beginning. Just uh, speak about okay. the <laughs> province board diapo. Um, so I think everyone um, that has joined us today knows Provence Rosé in general. Um, so we're going to be talking a bit about um, the background to Provence Rosé, the market. We're going to be talking a bit about the different regions of Provence Rosé. Um, because when I have the screen on, I'm not going to be able to see your questions. So if anyone has questions during the presentation, can you write them down in the chat and the Q&A? And at the end of the presentation, we can discuss a bit more about the wines. You. So you can see um, the beginning, the first slide we have, uh, Van de Provence, the taste of style. Um, this is the, the current marketing image, um, which is a sort of rolling image of just the, the quality of life that we associate with Provence Rosé. And when we talk about Provence Rosé, when we're talking about it today, I think what is very important to remember is that it's actually three appellations joined together in a marketing initiative, Côte de Provence, Côte d'Aix and Côte au Varoua. And what I, is, I think, quite unique um, anywhere in France, anywhere in Europe, of three appellations actually joining together, saying that they're going to keep their individual style, but are working together in a joint marketing initiative. And I think that is something that we, are, we often just talk about Provence, but it is multiple appellations working together. So quickly go through this. We've all looked at Instagram, I'm sure on Rosé. Um, as I keep saying to everyone, I have got past the stage of displaying Rosé in a bikini. And for me, the image of marketing Rosé is very much, I've, I now look at slightly different images, but this is the image, imagery that for a lot of people in the marketing world, consumers will see for Rosé. Brees, do you want to talk about the economics? Yes, yes, maybe. Um, um, I will give you some economic information and, uh, and maybe some conjunctural information. Um, first of all, you all know that uh, our particularity in Provence is that it's uh, a big vineyard specialized in rosé. Rosé is 90% of our productions. And we represent approximately 4% of the rosé world production and rosé world con consumption. Um, we have a, a rosé uh, world um, observatory, economic observatory. And each year we try to to, to analyze, analyze um, the rosé market. Uh, and the rosé market right now is um, quite um, concentrated. Uh, France is the biggest uh, producer and the biggest consumer of rosé, uh, far from the other. And, and we consume more rosé than we, than we produce, so that we import rosé. Uh, the second one is uh, the US. Uh, historically with uh, blush rosé and more and more with dry rosé. Uh, so for the moment, one important point is that the, this big rosé market consumption, approximately 26 million of hectoliters, uh, is not uh, completely developed. And uh, countries such as the UK, Germany, Belgium, or uh, even Asia, they consume very uh, few rosé for the moment. And so that we think uh, we can increase our market for the next years. Uh, maybe up oh, to the next one. So the, the rosé wine market is a, an increasing market, uh, plus 40% in the past 15 years, approximately, and it's, 11% uh, of the of the worldwide market uh, consumption, and we think it could go until 30, 35 millions of hectoliter in uh, in 10 years. So the, the market is increasing, and most of the countries they consume less than 5% of the 
of rosé wines compared to compared to red or white wines. And so we think we can increase our market share for the next years in uh, Europe countries, North American countries, and probably in Asia also. I think it's also quite interesting that um, last year with COVID, rosé consumption went up in many places because it was the easy, we didn't have, nobody had to sell the wine, they could buy a rosé and drink it at home. So I think last year we will, we will see uh, an increase again on consumption. And in this um, Rosé uh, uh, Observatory, we also look at the, um, the style of the Rosé wines. And it's, uh, it's uh, a good point, but not uh, such a good point to see that more and more Rosé are dry and pale. And probably because of our success in Provence, and we, we increase a lot our, our exports for the past 10 years. And the demand for the Provence Thai rosé is uh, bigger and bigger. So the the pale and dry and uh, fruity and aromatic rosé, and we see that lots of other regions tend to copy more and more the Provence Thai uh, rosé. And if everyone can just keep that in mind, because we will be talking about um, this later on, um, does pale color equal Provence style? And the same analysis on the, um, the, the sugar rate, uh, you can find more and more dry rosé or nearly dry rosé uh, between uh, zero or four gram per liters or between four and 10 gram per, per liters and less and less sugared rosé with more than 20 gram per liters. And the main point for one of the big point for us in uh, in Provence is uh, the growing market uh, on uh, on the international market. Uh, the the export for us was less than 10% of our market 10 years ago, and in 2020 it will be 40% of our market, uh, especially with the US the United Kingdom and the Netherlands, but we also have uh, big increases in uh, Australia or in uh, Germany, in Belgium. And so the, the demand for our, uh, our rosé style is bigger and bigger in lots of countries. Um, so we, we, have a, we think we have a good potential uh, on those uh, international markets. And that's why um, I will give you some, some information about the conjectural information about 2020. Uh, despite the, the situation and the economic difficulties, uh, our sales were, uh, were less, um, were more positive than we thought before because we, we decreased by approximately uh, minus 7% in 2020. And especially because of restaurants and on trade market in France or other countries. So the, rest, the closing of restaurants is a big issue for us right now. But on the off-trade market, we increase a lot. Uh, we increase by 2% in France, and we, we increase uh, by 6% in the export, uh, especially in UK, uh, Germany, or Belgium. So the off-trade market in France or international is very dynamic for us, and nearly uh, balance the decrease in uh, the on-trade market. Um, so that's why we are, um, I uh, could say uh, um, moderately optimistic for, for the future, uh, but we are still quite confident for the future because we think um, uh, there are still lots of potential and opportunities for us uh, for, for the next years, uh, even if uh, the 2021 will be probably still difficult because of the situation. And we, we had this year, we, we have um, a, a small harvest uh, because of the, um, of the, the, the freeze uh, during March. Uh, so we don't have uh, too much product on the market. Uh, the vintage is quite good because the agronomic conditions were very good, uh, except the, 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 the frozen period, of course. And so we think we could be dynamic 
And we also hope that the, um, the countries will reopen uh, the life uh, in April or in April or May, and it's the biggest uh, contribution period for us. So we think that it could be okay this year also um, uh, because of this uh, big contribution period in uh, spring, uh, summer, and beginning of the autumn. Uh, so we maintain our communication program. Uh, we we do more and more digital. Uh, digital communication uh, like today and we try some uh, virtual uh, exhibition like uh, Vino meetings or up wine in uh, in um, in March uh, between I think 15 or 16 of March and we hope we could also organize some real events uh, physical events uh, we hope that wine Paris will occur in June uh, and we we hope we could do some local events in Provence in uh, in July and August. So we try to find a good balance between digital and physical uh, events. Um, but we think that for wine and especially for rosé wines, uh, the conviviality and the social uh, meeting are really important. So we hope we could meet again in real uh, for the next months. Um, and for, at last, we also have a, a project for the environment. Uh, we 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 accelerate the development, the conversion in organic or HVE, high environmental value, um, uh, for our uh, wineries. So this year, we will have more than 40% of the area uh, converted in organic or HVE uh, label, and the objective is. Uh, nearly 100% in two, two, uh, 2025. Uh, so we accelerate the conversion and we also work on research program about new varieties adapted, adapted to the climate change and new practice uh, adapted to the climate change also so that we could reduce our environmental impact. Um, so those are very, uh, very big projects for the next five years uh, in Provence um, in the vineyard. And I think this is uh, the main information I wanted to give. Uh, and what, and there are some questions, oh, there are lots of questions. Uh, maybe I will try to answer right now because then I, I have to leave, but. Uh, Sorry, I have a lot of questions. Yeah, I see. Uh, is there a region breakdown of the conscription within France? Uh, this is good as a PDF. I don't need to. You don't have to say it if you have one. Yeah. That yeah. Um, the um, the conscription in France is decreasing because of restaurants. The, because the, of the reason for the question is I want to know if uh, if the majority of the rosé is being consumed in areas that produce rosé. Yeah. I want to know if it's local consumption. Um, of course. Uh, there is a big contribution right here in the region. We estimate that it's 30% of our market, okay. but we are uh, present nationally in France. You can find uh, Provence Rosé uh, in other areas too. Uh, also, because of our uh, image and speciality, uh, you can find Provence Rosé in Britain, in, uh, in Bordeaux, or lots of in Paris also. So there are rosé everywhere, for, uh, but the conscription right here, because it's our uh, uh, local uh, way of life, uh, is is big. Oh, that's right. Um, and then you, you ask about other colors. Uh, yes, um, in France, uh, the the rosé conscription has increased, but the red conscription is decreasing. Oh. Uh, the red wine conscription is decreasing, and uh, um, it's uh, maybe it's less the case in other countries. Uh, but in France, we used to consume lots of red wines, and the, the consumption is um, structurally decreasing. Okay. And 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 the sales of the vintage, uh, the, the we have, I, I think, the the harvest is uh, uh, approximately minus four four percent compared to two thousand nineteen. Okay. And it's it's uh, nearly the same than in two thousand eighteen. Okay, so it's not a huge a huge difference from the previous vintages then. No, but 2018 and 2019 were already small harvests, in fact. Ah, okay. 
That it, I did not uh, know. It's uh, the fourth the fourth year of uh, small harvest for us. Okay. okay. It is not so good, but uh, but because of the situation, this particular year it is not so bad. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Shall I carry on then? Yeah. Thanks a lot, Brice. A bit, um, we shall carry on and I'll try and answer any of the other technical questions later. Uh, so just a very, very basic introduction. This is where Provence is in France, the southeast corner. Um, I'm up near Nice. And so on the eastern end of the region, um, going all along the Mediterranean um, to the Rhone Valley. So it is a massive area. I think this is one reason why that we have the three appellations. We've got the Rhone Valley Rhone style. We have a coastal style. We have going towards Italy. It is a big area where there isn't only one style. It's historic. A number of vineyards do have Roman wells, Roman chapels, Roman remains in the cellar, in the vineyards. And some of the oldest vineyards in the region, you can tell that they're old because you can follow Roman roads uh, going through the area um, and Greek influence along the coast. So our dream destination, I can talk, I've moved down here, so it is very much the dream. Um, terroir, very, very varied terroir, and we'll go into that in more details. A varied climate. Um, people, we've got a lot of local winemakers and a lot of outsiders coming in. Um, I'm sure everyone's seen the news of uh, Moet Chandon investing. Um, there are a number of outsiders coming in, contributing cultural um, information and know-how. Um, as Brees mentioned, we have the Center for Rosé International uh, Global Research based in Provence, which is very much an on-hand place where people can discuss everything from clones to yeasts to irrigation, everything. So it's a quite a dynamic and varied region. Um, what vineyards dedicated to rosé? This is actually a much hotter topic than a lot of people are aware of. You can have vineyards or some vineyards say in Bordeaux where they'll say this year we were red, this year we're rosé, it depends on the vintage. Um, Kevin and I have been talking about vineyards in Germany, which are very dedicated to rosé because of the way they're made. Uh, but in Provence, they have very much focused on rosé vineyards. 90% of production is for rosé. And what does that mean? It means that uh, the training of the vines, we don't want for rosé big, robust, tannic, grapes with thick skins. We want to be able to keep that vital acidity for the rosé. So the way the vines are trained is very, very important. The type of grapes, the, the majority of being Grenache um, is also very, very important. So the know-how in the vineyard has developed specifically for rosé. In the cellar, uh, the very big, big difference here is investment. A lot of people think of rosé as being the quick cash crop. Um, I expect people will have heard say in California after the fires, harvest the red grapes early, we'll quickly make a rosé to avoid smoke taint and think you can make a good rosé. But the investment in the cellar in Provence is enormous. Um, temperature control, not only stainless steel, there's a growing number of rosés being made using barrels, but not heavily oaky barrels, amphora, and um, the research center. So there's a lot going on dedicating towards rosé. And you can see here um, the numbers. Negociant and cooperatives, I actually think in Provence are highly significant. One reason is that they create by um, taking grapes from around the region, uh, they can blend together the benchmark rosé that a lot of people think of. So there's a baseline of 
benchmark rosé. And then the independent producers on top of that have their own individual style. So I think there are two levels that we can look at for rosé. Um, but the cooperatives and negotiations, big investment in, in uh, understanding how to make rosé and leaders in what is we know of as the Provence style. So Cote de Provence is the biggest, um, as you can see, um, way ahead the dominant appellation. But if you look, the pink bit is Provence on the map. It is not all in one area. So there are variations within Cote de Provence, and we will be looking at that um, later on in the tasting. So some people have said Appellation Lalande or Appellation uh, Saint-Victoire, and this is actually um, a fault in that they are not appellations. These are te defined um, terroir within the appellation. So technically we should always say Côte de Provence Lalande, Côte de Provence Fréjus, Sa uh, Côte de Provence Saint-Victoire, because they are part of the Côte de Provence appellation, but just with a very defined terroir style. And we will talk again about that later on in the tasting. The Appellation, the terroir designation also, I should actually say, has different rules, slightly different grape varieties and different uh, production uh, volume compared with the rest of the appellation. Um, different numbers of people. So the number of people, say, for Côte de Provence Fréjus is a very small group of people um, producing wine under the Fréjus label. So maybe people will not have heard of that style so much. Very, very basic um, geology here. So we have the largest area, limestone, limestone and clay, which covers the big western part of the region and the schist to the southeast. What um, this map is not showing is that to the north of this area, we have the beginning of the Southern Alps, so that we have um, ripple effects of mountains coming down. So it's not just the soil type that is different. We have um, different gradients, different altitudes, different compression of these areas. So the around Fréjus, the reason why it is Côte de Provence Fréjus is that it's a more volcanic area, whereas around La Lande is more schist. And for those of you who drive around Provence, you can clearly see soil differences. When you're driving down, say, from Brignole to Toulon, on your left-hand side, you can see the sort of darker red color of Les Maures. And on your right-hand side towards Toulon and Bandol, you can see more white limestone. And it's, it's really very visually um, divided geologically, which makes it f very, very complicated. And I am looking forward to seeing a, ge a detailed geological map of the Appalachians around Provence. And here's a good example of the different color rocks. Can you see how red that volcanic rock is in the top right hand corner? Brilliantly red. When you drive along, whether it's raining or sunshine, that volcanic rock just shouts out at you. And quite often further inland in Provence, you also have very red soils, which is the bauxite, as in uh, which was mined for aluminium and limestone soils such as in uh, Côte de Provence Saint-Victoire, which gives a totally different acidity, reflects the sunshine in a totally different way. So this complexity of soils is part of the complexity of Provence rosés. A lot of sunshine, um, a lot of sunshine. Um, if any of you can see, maybe I've got a, a sunshine shining in on me now. Blue skies are what we have every day, but we also have the Mistral and we have maritime breezes. Mistral far more evident on the western side of the region, uh, where you have the trees 
all at an angle. The, the vines need to be protected a bit more from damage from the strong winds, but the mistral is incredibly important. It dries out. If there is any rain, it will dry the vines very quickly. 2020, we did have some mildew problems, but compared with other regions, that wind will just blow dry the vines. Maritime breezes really are maritime because we have mountains going along the coastal side, but they do bring in moisture and they bring in warmth from the coast, from the sea. Okay, organic and HVE. I am a big, big fan of HVE viticulture. Uh, I love the fact that it is not just uh, whether you put copper or sprays in the vineyard, it is a very, very holistic approach to winemaking, the entire environment. And I absolutely overjoyed the fact that they are really pushing this forward. So in another nine years, we're hoping to have 100% HVE. H, um, that's worthwhile looking even at the website for HVE just to see all the things that they do, encouraging wildlife, working with people from the vineyard all the way through to the cellar. And it's, it's a great initiative, really excited about that. Right, 90% rosé. This rosé has gone up and red wine has gone down, especially in Provence, because 30 years ago, a lot of rosé was still made in conjunction with red wine. So winemaking has changed and we now have rosé, sometimes a little bit split off the red, which gives just a little tiny bit of structure to the wine, but it's not a negative thing. I'm, I'm very much... Um, against the negativity associated with bleeding off the red wine. It is part of the winemaking process and when it's done well, it will make no difference and nobody will notice. It will just give a bit more structure. Um, white wine, I know we're not talking about white wine, but white wine from Provence is stellar. Really, really exciting, ages really well. And a lot of white wine has benefited from the knowledge of rosé, how to make freshness and really clear styles. So the grape varieties, um, I'm sure you all know, Sanso, which is much lighter in color, slightly floral, Grenache, which gives the ripeness of fruit, a bit of sugar level, um, raspberry type fruits, Tiburon, which grows best along the coast, um, and Côte de Provence Fréjus has a higher percentage of Tiburon. Again, gives a slightly floral character, Mourvedre, Syrah, Carignan, Cabernet, Sauvignon. Very rarely will you get in bigger quantities. Cabernet Sauvignon may be more in the northern parts of Coteau d'Ex, which is cooler, but they will give an extra bit of weight and depth to the wine. Fermentation, classic. Fermentation with white, not on the skins, unless it's an orange wine. Rosé from pressing. Now, going to be slightly technical here. You want gentle pressing for freshness. You want the grapes to be whole so that there's not, no crushing, no skin maceration going on. Cool temperature. The smaller the press, the better, because that will mean there's less skin content. So in effect, almost free run juice when you've got small, gentle pressing. Rosés with maceration a lot of producers do blend direct press with a bit of maceration, as I said, just to get that extra bit of complexity, depending on your grapes. Young fresh reds, I think there's a growing market because people like rosé, so more and more people want younger fresh reds. And then there's the, the Van de Garde, the big red wines, which we have um, with Mourvedre, Cabernet Sauvignon, Syrah coming through. So there really is a, a complete range of styles. We're not just white rosé red. We've got gradients of structure. And even with the whites, with the oaked whites. We don't have monovarietal rosés in Provence. We leave that to Languedoc and other places. In Provence, we are very much a blending region. Blending is um, a very important part in making rosé in that you can blend different vintage times, different grapes, be, can be fermented together or not. 
This helps some people um, with their tasting. I may be a bit old fashioned in that I sort of go off on a, a very limited range of fruits, but the citrus, floral, red, yellow plants and spices. I have noticed that um, if you're American, you will have totally different fruits. You have boysenberries and watermelon and cranberries, which we don't tend to have in Europe. So choosing your own flavors. Bean dry, bean dry less than four grams per liter is important in Provence because it's not a highly acidic wine. The importance of the sugar level is that it's in balance with the acidity. So if you have Rosé d'Anjou with eight grams per liter of sugar, it will probably taste as dry as a Côte de Provence dry wine because the acidity is that much higher. So always with rosé, ask the diff balance between the acidity and the sugar. Um, part of the marketing, I'm going to skip this for the moment because I want to go more on to discussing the wine styles. Um, the diversity we've discussed. Right, this is the exciting bit as far as I'm concerned because I have the wine. Um, and I'm afraid you're just going to have to listen to me talking about the wine. So we've got the five wines that we're going to be looking at, I'm going to be looking at and discussing with you. And we're going to start off with, um, right, um, can you all see that, the picture of the glass? So I've been doing a lot of tasting with wine glasses. And I see editor is watching. Um, a, discovered that wine glasses that have this very broad base, um, similar to the orange wine glass, is the best wine glass for rosé. I've tried it with the Riedel wine glasses, I've tried it with all sorts of tasting glasses, and what is amazing, you put the wine in this wider base that goes narrower at the neck, and it just brings out the flavours in a totally different way. I never believed in glasses making a difference, but really this shaped glass is what I now taste my, always taste my rosés in. It just makes them so much more interesting and much more fruity. The other thing I should say is these all came out of the fridge 90 minutes ago, if not more, two hours maybe, because nothing mutes rosé more than being ice cold in the wrong glass. You might as well just have pink water as far as I'm concerned. Treat it as a proper wine in the right glass and at the right temperature and you will get so much more out of the wine. So the first wine um, we've got is from Kotovawa, which is the green bit on the map. And there is a lot of discussion as to why Kotovawa is not Cote de Provence because it's bang in the middle of Cote de Provence. Some people say it's politics, but when I started in Prov working with Provence wine back in the 80s, when Coteau Varwa was still what was then VDQS, Vin de Limité Qualité Supérieure, everybody knew where Coteau Varwa was because that always got the frost. If people were buying holiday homes, people would go, well, don't go past the Côte de Provence border because you're more likely to have frost in the spring. And if you look through vintage reports, you will quite often see it's Côte d'Ivoire that gets more of the frost than Côte de Provence. On the good side, it's cooler. It's on this plateau. You can't really see the plateau when you're there, but it is slightly higher, slightly fresher, slightly cooler. So this is my Côte d'Ivoire wine. Um, so I'm just talking about the appellations, not the actual domain, um, because we have several examples showing. Mm. And what I particularly like about the Cote d'Ivoire wines is you get, I, I feel, um, it's a crisp mineral acidity. Um, with slightly more floral notes. And I think what is important is when I mention mineral acidity, um, crisp, clean, fresh red fruit, maybe that red currants, cranberry uh, flavor. Um, and I should say the 2020 vintage 
this is still on prima stuff. This is still really, really young. It's going to open out in the next few months. Um, and it is a much more delicate uh, vintage. I've noticed the alcohol is slightly late, lower, um, very crisp, very delicate, but very clean and very fresh. So Cote of Arwal with this coolness and this freshness is really um, showing very, very beautifully and quite, quite different. So that is something worthwhile bearing in mind. So um, going up to the northern part of that green area, you have several layers of mountains. So if I, if you can see where um, Le Bousse is at the top of the, just above Toulon, I'll ask one moment, here, no, how do I show it? I can't show it, anyway, just above Toulon. So you've got the massive Sambom, which is really high. They have ice houses at the top and that acts as a barrier for the warm winds from the Mediterranean. Then when you get to the northern part of Koto Vawa, you've got um, another mountain range and more vineyards. So the vineyards at the north part of Koto Vawa can be harvested five to six weeks after the coastal vineyards. We really are talking much, much cooler variation. Okay, so we're now going on to uh, three Cote de Provence wines. The first wine I'm going to be looking at is from Notre Dame des Anges, which is the new Côte de Provence Notre Dame des Anges, which is the new Denomination de Terroir. Um, this is its first vintage, which has been released. And I don't know if you remember when we were looking at the ge uh, pictures of the geology and there was the big red mountain that I mentioned with the Fréjus the, um, angle. Uh, so this is a, that is at one end of the Côte de Provence Notre Dame des Anges with the volcanic style, and it is the long central valley between Les Maux and the centre of Provence. Hot, protected from the sea breezes, a really much more concentrated hot, or I would say almost probably the most archetypal classic. Côte de Provence region. Multiple uh, soil styles, but as I say, it's this sort of basin of warm climate. And this has more exotic fruit, whereas I said the Côte de had that crisp red fruit, this has more exotic fruit, more of the white peach character. and definitely rounder, creamier fruit. And that is something very, very typical of this central valley. When you're driving down the central valley, you can see it's a communication corridor. It's got the motorway, it's got a river, it's got the railway line. It very much is this um, basin of vines going along with Limor on the south. So that is a nice ripe fruit. The second one I'm going to be looking at is from Côte de Provence Saint-Victoire, which is that lone Côte de Provence region you can see on the western side between Côte d'Aix and Côte d'Aix. Why is this on its own? This is an interesting region. Have How many people have seen the Cézanne paintings of Mont Saint-Victoire? Massive limestone soil. Limestone soil reflecting the light, giving creamier acidity, um, altitude. And some of the vineyards go up to 400 meters altitude on this steep limestone soil. And to the south, they've got more of this massive Sambon uh, vineyard protecting it. So again, a very sheltered area, but the limestone is really, really key. Gives it a lot of aging potential. So I discovered last year, I see minerality in colour. Um, it's only because somebody said to me, how can your minerality be blue or black or whatever? The difference between the Kutovawa 
and the Saint Côte de Provence Saint Victoire is that acidity texture and flavor and it is just so remarkably different. So that Saint Victoire limestone acidity it's broader in the mouth, it's creamier, it's whiter, it's almost, um, it's that ephemeral character that we quite often associate with a Côte de Provence wine. That limestone soil gives it the acidity, but without giving it a tightness of structure. Um, so I hope that makes sense. You're probably all keen down questions at this point and I'll have to answer later. The third Côte de Provence wine we've gone for is right down on the coast, Côte de Provence La Lande. Totally, totally, totally different. Schist soil, giving minerality, right down on the coast. So we're getting the full force of those maritime winds. So big buzzwords, minerality and saline character should be coming through on these wines. And you can smell it actually on the nose. When you smell it, it's this is when you want to have your seaside lunch. You can smell the sea almost coming through. This is blue, black, schister, saline minerality. Really quite austere. Doesn't have any of that ephemeral Saint Victoire a uh, classic character coming through. It's a really quite a grippy, intense, bone dry um, style of rosé. And interestingly, when these wines age, some of these characters develop in a slightly more intense way. But I think if I was talking about uh, matching with food, rosés from Côte de Provence, La Lande, for me, have, have that grippiness that I think I would maybe put with a slightly more powerful meal, um, which actually comes to one of my big dreams is that when you have a restaurant wine list, you don't have rosé and 300 reds and 300 whites. The variation of different styles, I'm looking forward for chefs to be able to say, I have 20, 30 different rosés, depends on what you're going to want to eat. So we've got, um, so far we've had the fresh, cooler climate, um, Côte Varois. We've had the warm, ripe, exotic fruit from Côte de Provence Notre Dame des Anges. Um, we've had the creamy acidity from Côte de Provence Saint Victoire and that mineral schisty character from Côte de Provence La Lande. And then we're going to go to the outlier from Côte d'Aix. Northern Côte d'Aix, um, so looking between Reparade and Riance, right up on the northeast side of Coteau d'Aix. We're looking at some of the highest altitude vineyards in Provence, and we're going to have more Cabernet Sauvignon in their rosés. But this is an area that really does need Denomination de Terroir because it is massive, because it also goes all the way down to the, the coast around Martigues, which is hot, and sandy and mistral blown. So where you get your wine from in Coteau d'Aix will be totally, totally, totally different from around the region in the same way that Cote de Provence is. Um, they really need to get their Denomination de Terroir um, focused on that. And I've actually got here slightly atypical from Provence, but a slightly darker rosé, which I was very keen to show because it is slightly darker and Côte de Provence rosé should not be defined by colour. I am really, I'm, I don't know, probably Côte de Provence will shout at me about this afterwards, I don't know, but for me it is the taste. The colour is almost incidental. The, the colour is giving the elegance and the finesse for sure, but if anyone is doing a blind tasting, do not Say, oh, it's pale, it must be Côte de Provence, because that's wrong. Here we have a slightly darker um, Côte d'Aix from uh, near Aix-en-Provence. And they've gone for a much fruitier, much more intense character, 
which I think is actually quite common in Koto decks. They have, in an attempt to maybe define their own Koto decks character, have been very happy to have slightly more structure and slightly more red fruit coming through on the wine. I wanted to talk, which is not, I don't have a slide for this, um, is the 2019 vintage because the 2019 vintage was totally, totally different. Whereas 2020 uh, appears to be, as I say, on this on primeur level, to have elegance and florality and uh, freshness, the 2019 vintage seemed to be a bit more intense and a bit more um, concentrated. And as such, um, I have a glass here from the 2019 vintage, is aging very, very well. And personally, I would be very happy to leave the 2020 for another couple of months to maybe May when it's going to open out a lot more and stick with some really gorgeous 2019 roses, which are, this one is showing magnificently at the moment. Do not think rosé dies within a year. It does not. My oldest Cote de Provence rosé that I had was 30 years old and tasting beautifully. So this is a myth um, which we should all do our best to avoid. Right, so I'm going to stop sharing now and see how many questions I've got. Oh my god, loads of questions. Right. Um, let's see. I'm just going to sort of zoom down. If anyone wants to put their hand up and unmute unmute and ask a question, please do while I'm scrolling through. Um, is it possible also? Yes, I'm sure we can give the presentation, not a problem. Uh, yeah, I think organic is under 30% at the moment. It's, I think, aiming for maybe 40. Is that right? Um, yep. Um, why do so many people consider Senye to be a lower quality product? Ooh, well, I don't want to name names, but somebody in Provence fairly recently did say Senye was bad, um, which I, who I disagreed with when he said it. But um, Senye is an interesting uh, winemaking technique in that if it is used as a byproduct of red wine, the red wine is the more important part. But if somebody, a winemaker, understands what Senye is and harvests the grapes at the right time and handles it well, it can make fantastic rosé. So I'm not against Senye. I think Senye can actually make very good style of rosé, but it is not the style that we have become used to in Provence. So I think um, it, is, it is a slightly more individual style there. Legal proportions for the grapes. Ah, so this is actually quite an interesting thing because somebody wrote fairly recently in an article that it was unusual to blend red and white grapes to make rosé, which I disputed because Provence rosé can actually have up to 20% of a white variety. And why that is important is it's not nothing to do with does it make the wine paler or anything like that, but you can actually contribute texture by adding a white wine to a rosé. You can, it often, white grapes will have slightly higher acidity, so, but you, so you could harvest a bit earlier to contribute the acidity and then allow more of the fruit, the riper red fruit. You can um, macerate a bit longer to add a bit more texture. You can do all sorts of clever things by adding white wine into red grapes, but they're not all there. Um, can we order a box of samples for the tasting? Um, I think we'll have to message you back on that one. Um, any other questions? Um, yeah, we'll get the PDF presentation and recording that has been done. So has anyone got, else got any questions they would like to ask? Kevin? Yep. Yes. 
sorry. <laughs> so back, back to the proportion of the grapes. If there are only two grapes, what is the smaller proportion? I think it's uh, 40%. 40%. It can be up to 90% of a grape mm -hmm. and 10% of another. That's what I mean. That's what I mean. Yeah, so, I, think it, I think you can do that. So you do have some wines that are, are like up to 90% Grenache with 10% Sanso. Um, or I think actually some of the wines I've had were... Uh, ninety percent Grenache and ten percent Syrah, so it's as good as. But you just need to add that little bit in. Yeah, exactly, and that's what that's what I mean precisely. Because if yeah. you if you can do ninety percent of a single grape, then in most markets that's legally a mono varietal wine. So you could really yes. market it as such. Uh, I I'm not sure. I presume, and I may be wrong, but I think one reason that it's not marketed as a varietal is that proportion of grapes will vary from year to year. Wow. So if you have Chateau X and you, one year you label it as Grenache and the following year your Grenache is not to get that character, you then have 60% Grenache. Do you relabel the wine? Mm. So the, in effect, Cote de Provence Rosé is not focusing on the variety it's very much focusing more on the terroir and how you can create with the grapes that you have that regional style thank you any other questions Um, I know Susan and I have been talking about the role of Sanso in Rosé, um, discussing how the importance of this variety, and Susan's been, I think you're writing this up, aren't you, uh, for a future post, um, looking at Californian Sanso and Provence Sanso in Rosé. And I think Sanso is one of those great varieties that people so often forget, but can actually contribute some of that delicacy that say in Cote de Provence Saint Victoire matches up with that limestone soil, but could possibly be lost with the schistous soil of Cote de Provence La Lande. So again, coming back to your question about which grape varieties, it's the terroir driven character that's coming through there. Hi, Tony. Tony, sorry. Um, Sanso is such a, yeah. I mean, I think Sanso is, a very beautiful grape, as is Tiburang, but Tiburang um, is a slightly more difficult grape variety. Uh, Cote de Provence Fréjou stipulated 15% minimum Tiburang, which scared a lot of people off because it is a, a more difficult grape variety. It has ripening um, problems sometimes, so that makes it slightly sad. The other question is, there's uh, Rosé du Var and Caladoc coming in. Um, so, yes, what is the contribution to the blend Tiburang? Tiburang uh, is one of those grape varieties where there is, the people who love it quite often have a really high percentage. There are a number of vineyards that have up to 90% Tiburang in the wine. And it is... It is like Sanso, but I think it just has a bit more structure, partially because it's that unevenness of ripening. So it got, it keeps with those few hidden unripe berries, a bit of acidity and then the fruit. The, sorry, the, the question next, sorry, screen next to you. And I'll come back, I've written about it. So I'll send you the link on that. Okay, Ellen is saying, has given her email address if there are any more questions, but I've got a few more minutes if anyone wants to say anything now. How important are Tenturier varieties in rosé production, not in Provence? I mean, when you've got a colour like that, Tenturier is not what you want. It's definitely um, not there. Um, I think we haven't had we've had gone for very purity of style here we haven't had any oat rosé uh, which is something else to think about and possibly a reason why you might have um 
maybe more Cabernet Sauvignon Blanc, Sauvignon, Cabernet Sauvignon, or more Vedre in a rosé if you're going to have oak. Susan, for the Calad Doc and Rosé Duvar, I'll send you an article um, which I was reading this morning about those varieties which are coming up. So Caladoc, um, just briefly, one of the problems, like everywhere in the world, is global warming, climate change. Um, as Brees said, we've had a run of four years of much smaller vintages. We've had far more erratic weather. So there is a lot of work looking at north facing slopes, higher altitude, climate resistant varieties coming through. So it is a dynamic area. Uh, somebody once asked me why I was interested in rosé. I find it the most dynamic wine category in the wine world right now, because anything you know, it has the potential. We've reached a quality level now that now people are exploring and being creative and doing all sorts of things. So um, just for a moment, a couple of more written questions. How can we change the impression in the minds of consumers and sommeliers and retailers? This is something that actually I think COVID has been wonderful. We can't before COVID, I could do master classes with, with exciting rosés and I would reach 10, 20 people. Um, I know people have been to some of my master classes before, say at Wine Paris or Provine. We struggle to get people into a master class of rosé because it's rosé and it's not cool and it's not hip and da 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 da. Um, and then you can show them an exciting rosé and people will leave going, I didn't know Rosé did that, but I've reached 10 people. And one of the exciting things about Zoom, and, and I know Côte de Provence have done this, they've been able to knock out masterclasses in Australia at a speed that before they couldn't do, sending out tasting packs. And it's reaching people is really important. The other thing that I get very, very angry about are cut and paste journalists who will say, I've got 10 Cote de Provence Rosé and they're so nice because they're pale. And I get so angry because, you know, it's an insult to the wine style and the potential that can be done there. So getting out there, writing something radical, tasting something different, uh, being involved in more tasting classes. What about Rosé in Latin America? Ah, oh, well... I'm struggling. I'm still tasting rosé in Latin America that um, some of it is nice. Um, Latin America, although I would say as much as anywhere else, very, very different. So, you know, Uruguay is a lot of Tanat and Muscatel. Chile has a lot of Cabernet. Uh, also worthwhile noting, do they export to the American market because the sugar levels might be slightly different? So... Um, that is quite a, a big difference. And I've recently just tasted a load of rosé from New Zealand. Europeans don't listen. 90% Sauvignon Blanc with a splash of Syrah or Pinot Noir for the colour. It is quite difficult to appreciate because it's not how we expect it. Um, any other? No Tinturier. Okay, so I think um, if there are any other questions, Alain can actually pass them on to me if anyone wants to hear me um, talking about it. Um, but yes, radical. We want radical with Rosie. We want people to step up to the plate and say, don't be boring, be, take initiative um, and think outside the box. Uh, and yes, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. So if you have more questions, you can send us to by, by email and uh, we will send you the presentation and uh, the video um, probably on Monday. Uh, just the time to, to change the video and the person who make it for us is not here to, today and tomorrow. So on Monday, we will send you everything. And there is also uh, 45 Rosé, Côte de Provence, or Ro Provence Rosés exhibiting at Pink as well. Is that right? Who are ready for, yeah, absolutely. if anyone wants yeah, to talk to you. On Vino meetings, on the Vino meetings, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and hopefully Wine Paris, Pink. Pink is the Rosé festival. Um, 
through which this has been organized. Yes. So. Yes. We have Laurent with us. Um, I can't see Laurent. That's yeah. why I was looking. Do I need my glasses? Oh, yeah. Hello, Laurent. Laurent, do you want to explain Pink? Yes, Pink is um, is a show that was a, a normal show in Cannes, in Palais des Festivals. But now we moved it into a digital uh, edition this year. So it will be for uh, March. I think it's the 12th and well, around the 12th of March for one week where we will exhibit all the producers, 45 producers from, from Provence, but not only, also uh, about 70, I think, from uh, Languedoc and some from uh, Italy. Um, the, the buyers will be able to go on the website and to pick up some wine to, to taste. So you go, you put that in your basket and then you are putting in contact with uh, producers. So it's a, a digital way to bring buyers and producers on, on, the, same, uh, on the same platform. And uh, so it's open now for um, Vin de Provence, only Vin de Provence this week. And then in a month, it will be pink where all uh, producers from different regions can be met. So the best moment is now to go on the Vino Meetings, Vin de Provence uh, dot uh, Vino Meetings dot com where you will find uh, uh, the 45 uh, uh, producers from, uh, from Provence, from all different regions that you already mentioned. Good. And Kevin, yeah, I think uh, journalists need, um, we need special services really for tasting. Um, it's something that um, needs to be done, but Helene is yes. nodding. Yeah. This is something yeah. that's, I mean, I tried to get look at the samples also for the CIVB thing for this, and it seems to be oriented on buyers, and I understand that. But it's the same with Chianti Classico and other sort of things. I can't say anything about these wines if I can't taste them, or I won't say anything about these wines if I can't taste them. I understand that samples have to go to buyers, but you'll get more buyers if people can talk about the wine. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Maybe Ellen, I talk with you. Um, we can arrange, uh, just decide on a good selection to send to you. Would be nice. Yes, yes. Good. So maybe we will uh, close the station. <laughs> <laughs> that to, to respect the time. Just to respect the time. And, uh... Yes. So I, I think most of you know how to get in touch with me. I'm very open. My name is. Um, I don't have a hidden name on social media. So if anyone wants to ask me any questions, please do. And uh, we can carry on discussing things. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.